stuff that was actually going to it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Siskin. This is a true Chicagoan who was actually raised the Chicagoans, okay? Grew up in Chicago, studied in Chicago, has made his career in Chicago. And the Cubs fan. Cubs fan on top of it. The other thing that's wonderful about Professor Siskin is he knows how to take complex ideas like Maimonides got into in God and discuss them on the way that we can all enjoy it and understand it. And it's that's a special talent to, to do. So it's a real pleasure and an honor for us to have Dr. Siskin here. Um, I must say, looking out on this audience, uh, you get this many people for a lecture on Maimonides on a cold winter night? Can the Messiah be far off? I, I, okay, well. We're going to uh, do Jewish philosophy tonight, and um, what that means very simply is we're going to look at Judaism and ask ourselves the question, what is it all about? Why are we doing all of this? Uh, the prayers, the holidays, the dietary laws, the, what is it for? Uh, now, I don't expect you to ask that question of yourself every day. Uh, I ask it every day because I'm a professor and I get a paycheck for asking that question. Uh, but I do think, look, in every reasonably intelligent person, once in a while should stand back and say, why? Why are we doing all of this? What is the reason? Uh, Moses Mendelssohn said, Religious actions without religious thoughts, in other words, you don't think about it, are mere puppetry and not service to God. So uh, when we ask the question, what is it all about? Maimonides gave a very straightforward answer. Now, if you don't know about Maimonides, uh, he was born in Cordoba in Spain in 1138. Uh, he died in Cairo in 1204. He lived his whole life in Arab lands. He wrote much of his literature in Arabic. And uh, he was very open about his debt to Islamic philosophers, uh, many of whom he quotes repeatedly. Uh, so if you're going to study uh, Jews in Arab lands, uh, keep Maimonides in mind. Okay, what is Maimonides' answer to the question, why are we doing all of this? Well, look, traditionally there are 613 commandments in the Torah. That's a large number. Maimonides said that all of them are means to an end, that, that all of them are getting us to a particular end, and that end is to observe the first two commandments. In other words, he's singling out the first two commandments from everything else we do. And he's saying that's the foundation of this religion and that's why we're doing all the rest of this stuff, to put ourselves in a position to observe the first two commandments. Okay, what are they? Well, commandment number one, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Commandment number two, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make a graven image or any likeness of anything in the heaven, on the earth, or in the waters below. So, says Maimonides, what this amounts to is you are supposed to espouse monotheism and reject idolatry. If you do that, you've got it. That's the purpose of everything else. And uh, I know what you're thinking. Here's what you're thinking. Uh, to espouse monotheism. 
Of course we espouse monotheism. Look, Siskin, we know. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We didn't need you to come all the way from Chicago to tell us that. Monotheism. Let's break it down etymologically. Monotheism. Belief in one God. We don't need you or Maimonides to inform us. We already know that. And what about idolatry? Look, there are certain things in Jewish life that are temptations. I don't know, well, maybe for some of you, uh, pork ribs are a temptation. <laughs> Shrimp salad is a temptation, I don't know. But look, suppose, nobody, not even the most wayward Jew is, is anymore is tempted to bow down to idols. I, nobody, again, I don't care how far out you are in the tradition, nobody has a statue of Baal in their bureau drawer when nobody's looking, you know, can pull it open and start bowing down. I mean, that seems like a dead issue. So what are you here for, Seaskin? Okay, let's put it on the table. First thing I'm going to try to tell you is it's a lot more complicated than you think. So let's start out with monotheism. And here is what I want you to do. We're going to try what philosophers call a thought experiment. Okay? An experiment in your mind. I want you to imagine yourself back in a pagan culture like ancient Greece. Are you with me? I want you to imagine, for the sake of argument, that you believe that all of the gods and goddesses are not only, they're all fake except one. Let's make it feminine. You believe that the only true god is Athena. Okay? And you believe that she's exactly the way Homer described her. Uh, it's exactly the way she's depicted in the Partha with her battle helmet and her spear. So you believe in the sole divinity ship of Athena. There's no other god or goddess out there. Okay? Suppose you walk in, there's a big statue of Athena there. Does that make you a monotheist? After, there's only one. There's only one. If you believe in the sole divinity ship of Athena, does that qualify as monotheism as Judaism understands the term? Or, let's rephrase this, is there a distinction to be made between monotheism and monolatry? Or if you want to put it in another way, is there a distinction to be made between monotheism and single deity paganism. There better be. There better be a distinction to be. Better be a principal difference. And my question is, what is that difference? So what I'm trying to, what I hope I'm trying to get you to see here, right off the bat, there's got to be more to monotheism than just arithmetic. It can't be just one as opposed to 15. Yes, there is an arithmetic claim, but that can't be all there is. Because if that's all there is, we might as well put up the statue of Athena. So that can't be right. And what about idolatry? Uh, 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 what about the second commandment? God says, I don't want you to have any other gods before me. Why? Is that because no other gods exist or just that God wants to be the chief God over all the others? And why can't we make an image? The second commandment doesn't tell us why we can't. Uh, if you go into the Sistine Chapel uh, at the Vatican, there's Michelangelo has got this famous painting of God. You know, uh, What's so bad about that? Is that really 
uh, that grievous of a sin? Well, see, I, 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 this is my job. I get paid for confusing people. This is, this is what I do, my calling. All right. If you look at the Torah, the Torah, particularly the early books, it, it really isn't all that clear about monotheism, truth to tell. Uh, we really don't know what Abraham believed about God. We don't know whether Abraham believed that there were lots of gods out there, it's just that the God, his God, the God of Israel, was supreme. Okay, that's in Greek mythology. You've got a lot of gods and goddesses, but Zeus reigns supreme on the top of the mountain. We don't know what Abraham believed because the Torah never tells us. There is a midrash that we all learned in Sunday school about Abraham smashing his father's idols. Okay, but that's not in the Torah, that's rabbinic. Why did the rabbis uh, produce that midrash? Because the Torah doesn't tell us why God chose Abraham. And the rabbis tried to come up with a good reason, and the reason they came up with was, well, as a little kid, he was a budding monotheist and smashed the air. Okay, it's not in the Torah. You don't know how many times I've had students in class say, I know it's there, I know it's there, I know he smashed his father's idols, and I say, right, quote me chapter and verse. And uh, they get dispirited, okay, it's not there. Or what about Micha Mocha Bo Elim Adonoi? That's in the, uh, the Song of the Sea, uh, 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 me, Book of Exodus. Micha Mocha Bo Elim Adonoi. Who is like you among all the gods? That's literal translation. Who's like you? I mean, that does suggest that there are other gods and that our God or the God of Israel is just the supreme one. Uh, the new uh, Jewish publication society messes around a little bit with the translation. It says, who is like you among all the celestials? Because they don't want to use the word uh, uh, gods, which is clearly there, and uh, they don't tell us who the celestials are or what they're doing. Or Okay. But uh, that prayer leaves it a bit open as to what the prayer is really trying to, uh, to say. Now, I'm here to uh, argue that uh, the first true monotheist, first one who I think got it exactly right, is a prophet called Second Isaiah, Deutero Isaiah. He's the second person to write in the name of Isaiah. There were three. Uh, he's a post-exilic prophet. He's after 586. We don't know anything about him, really. He nails it by making two claims. Here they are. First one, he says, is this. I am the first and I am the last, and there is no other God but me. All right, that gives us the arithmetic. There's no other God out there. That clarifies it and says there's only one. And we know that arithmetic is part of the answer, but it isn't the full answer. So let's move on to his second claim. He says, to whom then will you liken me? He's speaking in the name of God. To whom then will you liken me that I should be compared? To whom will you liken me that I should be compared? Not the mightiest nations on earth, not the mightiest armies, not the biggest castles we could go on, not the, uh, uh, the mightiest uh, natural forces, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, uh, volcanoes. Nothing is compared to God. There's nothing you can compare to God. Anything that you would compare to God, according to the prophet, would insult God. Okay, so what is Second Isaiah claiming? He's claiming that God is special or unique. That God is in a class entirely unto him or herself. Or, as he says a little bit later on, compared to God, 
All of these things are as nothing. They're, they're, they're zero compared to God. There's no comparison at all. So the uh, great 19th and early 20th century philosopher Hermann Cohen suggested that we uh, think of the Shema in a different way. And I, I'm completely with him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is unique. That's really what it says. Comparable to nothing, unlike anything else. And that's what you could not have said about Athena. She looked like a human being. She dressed like a human being. She had human emotions. She uh, talks like a human being. She was nothing but a human being glorified. And that's why she doesn't count uh, as a deity. So I'm going to press real hard tonight on the concept of uniqueness, and we're going to get into uh, Maimonides uh, on uniqueness, and it's going to get even more controversial. So, uh, so bear with me. Let's, why no image of God? Let's go to the second. Why can't we make an image of God? Well, look, uh, if you uh, look, at the, look at the way gods and goddesses were depicted in the, in the ancient world. Uh, Zeus, you know, had big muscles and six-pack abs and uh, this, you know, really solid expression. Uh, Aphrodite had a gorgeous figure and wavy hair. Marduk, the god of uh, Babylonia, was often depicted as a dragon or a snake to terrify people. Uh, Asherah was a mother goddess. Uh, she had protruding breasts. Uh, suppose we said, wait, slow down. Slow down. Muscles, breasts have nothing to do with divinity. Zero. They don't get you to God at all. It, you're, you're going entirely in the wrong direction. So there was a guy, I've been putting down the ancient Greeks, but there was a guy in the fifth century BC, a Greek philosopher, who was a proto-Jew. He wasn't Jewish, but he should have been. Now, I have a, a, you'll have to have me back for another lecture, because I, I have a category, people who were not Jewish, but who should have been. <laughs> Edward R. Murrow, <laughs> Woody Guthrie. Uh, then I have a category of people who were Jewish, but who should not have been. <laughs> Roy Cohn, <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein, Bernie Madoff. Okay. This guy's name. This guy's name was Xenophanes. Xenophanes. You're not going to be tested. To just relax. Okay. His name is Xenophanes. And uh, what Xenophanes said is, uh, you know, he said it's a funny thing. The Thracians believe that God has red hair and blue eyes. The Ethiopians believe that God has dark black hair and dark eyes and a snub nose. And if horses believed in God, do you know how they would depict God? With two ears and a long snout and four legs and a tail. Because what he was saying is that as soon as you try to image God, the chances are what you're going to do is take your own image and project it into heaven. So, I mean, if you picture God as uh, uh, somebody, if you anthropomorphize God and think of God as, as, a, as a person sitting in a chair, suppose we would go around the room right now and ask you what you're imagining, I'll bet you that none of you imagine God as an Asian or a Native American, or an African American. I'll bet you that that's the case. That you all, and I'm as guilty as anybody, we all, we're going to imagine God looking pretty much like our grandfather or grandmother. Okay? And that misses the whole point of divinity. It's not our own image. 
And that's why the second commandment says, all the images are wrong. It doesn't matter whether it's something in the sky, on the earth, or in the waters. Don't even start. Don't even go down that road. Once again, why not? Because nothing is comparable to God. Nothing that can be imaged is comparable to God, no matter how glorious the image may be. Okay. Now let's go to Maimonides. Maimonides thought that you could sin against the second commandment, what prohibits idolatry. He thought you sin against the second commandment not just by bowing to a piece of clay. He thought you sin against the, you can sin against the second commandment in your mind. If you think of God as a human being. If when you're praying, you form an image of God in your mind of a person, you're an idolater, according to Maimonides. You have violated the second commandment, one of the foundations of Judaism. You're, you're, you're not a monotheist anymore. He thought that, by the no matter how much of the rest of the tradition you observe, no matter how kosher your pots and pans, no matter how much you go on Shabbat or the festivals, if you're praying to a human being or the image of a human being, you've missed the boat entirely. Okay, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are certainly a lot of passages in the Torah that seem to suggest, do they not, that God is a human being. There are, you know, I mean, this is long, uh, we listed it as long as your arm. Doesn't the Torah say that God, uh, that God walked with Noah? Doesn't the Torah say that God saw? God saw what was going on on earth. He didn't like it or she didn't like it and brought the flood. How many times does the Torah say God spoke? God spoke these words to Moses. God descended uh, on Mount Sinai. Okay, it does say all of that. But, says Maimonides, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't take that stuff literally. Yes, it's there. Yes, it's there. But you've got to reinterpret those passages in a way that is consistent with the second commandment, with not forming a mental image. So if the Torah says God walked with Noah, or Noah walked with God, it doesn't mean that they walked down the street the way you and I did. What it means is that Noah was b beloved of God, that, 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 that Noah was, was a Zadik, was a righteous man, and found favor with God. It's just it's a metaphorical way of speaking. When it says God saw, it doesn't mean that God sees the way you and I do. It means God knew. God knew, not that God has eyes. When it says uh, uh, God spoke, it doesn't mean, uh, like at Mount Sinai, it doesn't mean, according to Maimonides, that it's, it's not like uh, an announcer at a football game. Now starting at tight end. Okay, that, that, don't, no. God descended on the mountain. It doesn't uh, uh, mean that God descended. Is that when I, in my apartment, I get in my elevator and descend onto the first floor. No, no, sorry. God is, doesn't have spatial location. We have to reinterpret all of these things. God descended on Mount Sinai just means revelation was about to occur. God spoke, according to Maimonides, means that Moses was in a position to understand what God wanted. But none of this anthropomorphic language can be taken in its literal sense. And now comes a passage in Maimonides that got him into a lot of trouble, which I love. This, I think is one of the most profound things he ever wrote. So fasten your seatbelts for this one. Maimonides says, it is not true, it is not true that God is wiser than I am. 
it is not true that God is more powerful than I am. It is not true, not true, that God lasts longer than I'm going to last. It is not true that from a moral perspective, God is better than I am. What's going on? Not true that God is wiser than I am? What, what, what is he getting at here? Well, let's suppose you said it is true. Suppose you said, yeah, it is true that God is wiser than I am. What worried Maimonides is that you would be putting God and me on the same scale. Right? You'd be saying that God has a higher IQ or better SAT scores, whatever you want. You'd be putting God and me on the same scale. But let's go back to second Isaiah. To whom will you liken me that I should be compared? You can't compare divine wisdom to my wisdom or your wisdom. You can't put us on the same scale. God is off the scale of anything that you and I could possibly be on. When I was going to high school in Skokie, the kid I used to ride the bus with, we'd stand out there in cold mornings waiting for the school bus to arrive. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. I didn't. Okay, his name was Marty. Marty is, was smarter than Ken, I, okay? No question. I actually was better in English than he was, but it's certainly in science and math. He, but you could put Marty and me on the same scale. That made sense. But you can't do that with God. God's wisdom is infinite, is unlike ours. If you want to see this in another way, let's try power or strength. Arnold Schwarzenegger is stronger than Kenneth Seaskin. Yeah, that's okay. But if you're going to deal with lifting weight or horsepower or any other mechanical determination of power, that doesn't compare at all to the power of being able to create the whole universe ex nihilo, out of nothing. There's no comparison there whatsoever. So what Maimonides is saying here is, God is off the scale of anything else, whether it's power, intelligence, uh, 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 morality. Uh, uh, God bears no resemblance to us. And this is, if you're following me, another way of saying that God is unique. And now we're going to get even more controversial. So you think of this as we're moving up the mountain. Okay? I'll try to get you to the top if I can. But all of this is about what it means to say, what it means to worship something that is truly unique and to take uniqueness seriously. Maimonides thought that uh, God had no emotion, emotions are fleeting. They come and go. They get in the way of rational thought. Uh, he th says they usually imply limitation, jealousy, anger, de depression, uh, resentment. God, Maimonides thought that God uh, has none of this. Now we know that it's had God gets angry in the Torah, interpreted literally. But now we also know that literal interpretation can get us into trouble. So when the Torah says that God is angry, Maimonides says all it means is that God is, uh, 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 rejects or that uh, uh, God is uh, 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 telling us not to pursue idolatry. Most of the time when God is angry, it's about idolatry. So for Maimonides, it isn't that God's blood pressure gets up and gets red in the face and you know, it's nothing like that. It's just trying to emphasize how bad the sin of idolatry really is. Okay. In the prayer book, the Siddur, uh, there are lots of descriptions of God. 
God is a judge. God is a teacher. God is a friend. God is a king. God is a lover. Well, these things are okay up to a point. They're trying to, to teach you something. But wait a minute. These are uh, social categories. These are categories that apply to human beings. Strictly speaking, strictly speaking, God can't, isn't the king or a friend, or a judge, or a teacher, or a lover. It's not, he's not asking you to throw the prayer book out. He's just asking when you read those kind, Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, when you read those kind of prayer, he wants you to be self-conscious about what you're doing. He wants you to see these are not literal descriptions of God. They're there to induce a mood of reverence, they're there to uh, uh, lift us up and uh, to begin to think about what it means to have a transcendent deity. They can't be literally true. All right, one more step up the mountain for Maimonides. All praise of God, all praise of God eventually falls short. Why? Because God is beyond any praise that we can possibly offer. And to make his point, he quotes a rabbinic passage which goes as follows. Imagine there were a king, and imagine the king had enormous wealth, possessed many pieces of gold. And imagine that we come along and praise the king for possessing silver. Well, there's a sense in which our praise falls short. The, 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 the king is, is beyond the level that we're at. And so what Maimonides wanted us to say is, yes, we should praise God. He's, it, it's, he, he, yes, you should say the prayers. But what he wants you to see is this, and I think it's important that human language, human categories, can only take you so far. They can't get you completely to something that is totally unique. And maybe that's summed up in the following passage. This is from Maimonides. Glory then to him who is such that when the intellects contemplate his essence, their apprehension turns into incapacity. When they contemplate the proceeding of his actions from his will, their knowledge turns into ignorance. When the tongues aspire to magnify him, when they try to praise him, by means of attributive qualifications, all eloquence turns into weariness and incapacity. God is beyond our ability to pray. Even if you use superlatives, mightiest of the mighty, uh, wisest of the wise, best of the best, I don't care, most powerful, they're all still human terms and human care. They get us so far, but not to the end. Well, what now? What are we going to do? Can we really know this God? And if you've been following this lecture, there's a clear sense in which you can't. There's a clear sense in which if God is truly unique and beyond our ability to praise, that there's much about God we cannot know. So to back this up, Maimonides asks us to turn to a famous passage in the Torah, Exodus 33. Now, I don't have to go through You all have Exodus 33 memorized, right? Nobody, do you really? 
Everybody know about Exodus 33? No, all right. Exodus 33, Moses is alone with God on the mountaintop. And Moses says to God, if I found favor with you, Moses wants a more intimate relation with God. If I found favor with, with, with you, show me your face. Show me your face. And God says to Moses, I'm sorry. No mortal can see my face and live. No mortal can see my face and live. Now, the first time I read that passage, I thought of Medusa. Remember from Greek mythology? She was so ugly that if you looked at her, you turned to stone. Who is it? Uh, is it uh, Perseus who uh, slays her because he comes with a mirror? It, he doesn't look right at Medusa. He's looking at a reflection in the mirror. He takes the okay. Uh, is that what God is saying here? Is God saying to Moses that if you look at uh, Moses looks at the face of God, that Moses will turn to stone? Is that what it's about? That's a literal interpretation, but we know that literal interpretation often gets us into trouble. We don't want trouble. In the passage then, if you know this passage, God says, I can't show you my face, but I'll tell you what. I'll give you a consolation prize. If you stand behind that rock, I will reveal my backside to you, not my face. I will reveal my backside to you. What is the backside of God? And when Moses stands behind the rock, uh, uh, God uh, then says, uh, famous passage, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. It will cause all of my goodness to pass. So the goodness of God is identified with God's back side. What in the world is going on in this passage? So Maimonides uh, uh, comes to the rescue and says this. You can't see my face means you can't really know what I am or who I am. There is a sense in which I will always be a mystery to you. When you look somebody directly at their face, you look them in the eye, there's a sense in which you think you sort of captured who they are. And God is saying, sorry, you can't do that. I'm unknowable to you. You'll never pierce the veil of mystery that surrounds God. Backside, says Maimonides, means... Our only way of getting knowledge of God is always a step removed. We can know what God has done, but we cannot know who or what God is. Let me explain. Let's try this as a metaphor. This is me, not, not Maimonides. So let's see if it works. Let's suppose that there's a billionaire in Santa Fe, okay? If there's a billionaire in the audience right now, I hope you're paying very close attention to what I'm about to say. The billionaire makes a huge donation to public and social organizations. So uh, the, the next thing we see is uh, the homeless uh, are given shelter, uh, people are given adequate uh, medical care, adequate legal care, uh, libraries are well stocked, universities expand, synagogues can bring in more lecturers on Jewish philosophy. Okay, it's, it, it, we see the effects of this donation. Ah, uh, but now let's suppose one more thing. Suppose the billionaire has read Maimonides. 
is what does Maimonides say about giving to charity? That the highest form of it, you have to remain anonymous. Okay, so now it, it just let, let's work with this. The identity of the donor is unknown to us. The identity of the donor is and will always remain a mystery. We don't know who the donor is. We'll never know. We don't know what the donor's motive is. We don't know anything of sort of the internals of the donor. What we do know is the effects of what the donor has done. So if you want a way of thinking about this, let's try to put it this way. We know the actions, but not the actor, if, if you're with me. We can praise the actions. These are, these are wonderful things. But we can't go from those actions to the identity of the person who gave the money in the first place. So Maimonides says that's what it means. We know this person one step removed. We don't have direct access. We're a step removed. That's how Maimonides is thinking about the backside. The qualities that, uh, that God revealed to Moses, uh, God's backside, mercy, graciousness, slowness to anger, willingness to forgive sin. We can praise all of that as long as we realize we've got the actions and not the identity of the actor. If Moses can't look into the face of God, then I assure you neither can you or I. Neither can anyone. No mortal can see my face and live, says God. Now, at this point, you may want to object. I'm sure there's going to be objections. You may want to object and say, wait a minute, Seaskin. Most of your lecture, frankly, has been in the negative. God doesn't resemble anything. We can't make an image of God. God is not on any scale that we're on. God does not have emotion. God is not literally a king, a judge, a teacher, or a lover. Uh, don't you see, Seaskin, that you keep saying, God is not this, God is not that, God is... A well, if you're right, Seaskin, and if Maimonides, if you're trying to explain Maimonides, then we're left with a fair amount of ignorance. What kind of a religion is that? Look at how much I've said about what we can't know about God, even the Torah, you can't look God in the face. Okay, here I'm gonna get personal. Uh, yes, I'm a college professor, I teach all levels, but what I really love to teach, probably most of all, are freshmen. I love teaching freshmen, I can't wait. Do you know why? Because freshmen know everything. <laughs> it's wonderful. They come into class on the first day and they know everything, no matter what question you ask, all the hands go up, I've got the right answer. I love to see it. So what I tell them on the first day of class is, you know what, there's a sense, we've got to be careful here, there's a sense in which when you leave this class on the last day, you're going to know less than what you think you know on the first day. <laughs> I'm going to show you in a way how little you know. I'm going to show you that, uh, and you know, here they're paying high tuition, you know. To, I'm going to show you that maybe there isn't something all that bad sometimes about ignorance. What? We're paying tuition to learn, about, to, to become ignorant? Well, in a way, yeah. So let's make a distinction here between simple ignorance, which I will, the ignorance of the fool, 
and nobody's recommending that. But let's also think about what I'm gonna call learned ignorance or studied ignorance. The ignorance that may take you a lifetime, a lifetime of study to realize just how limited your knowledge actually is. Now I put it to you that learned ignorance can be a great achievement. And when we get to God, again, this is the issue of uniqueness, comparable to nothing. When we get to the issue of God, learned ignorance may be all we can get. The, the backside, okay, that, that's all right, but that's not the face. If you want to deal with the face, if you want to deal with who or what God actually is, put it to you that learned ignorance is the best we have and the best we're ever going to get. I mean, suppose it were otherwise. Suppose I came in here and said, you know what, I know everything about God. I know, you know, here's, you know. uh-uh, uh-uh, that's a lie. So, if this is right, let's go back and think about Judaism as a whole. We are asked to worship a God that we cannot see, that we cannot make an image of, that we cannot control, and that in many ways we can't understand. Is that what you're telling us, Seaskin? That that's what Judaism is about? Answer, that's exactly what I'm telling you. That's what it comes down to. It's very hard to fulfill the first and second commandments. It could take you a lifetime of study to get to the point where you're actually fulfilling the first and the second commandment in the way that Maimonides uh, expected. They're not easy to do. If you think about monotheism and what we've done tonight, there's a sense in which it says as much about us as it does about God, maybe more so. Because what monotheism has taught us is how limited our knowledge is, how limited our categories are how limited our uh, uh, praise, that all of this in some ways falls short. Now, as I say, I, 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 I don't want you to give the impression that I'm perfect. I'm, not, I mean, I'm as guilty as the next one on, on, on struggling to fulfill these commands and, and not always making it. It's very, very hard. Judaism is a hard religion. If you, you can reject everything I've said tonight. Well, I'm just going to insist on one thing. If you, if you give me one thing, you can reject everything else I've said. You can run me out of town if that's what you want to do. Just, just, just give me one thing and I'll be happy. And that is that there's more to monotheism than just saying the six words of the Shema. You can't just say the Shema. I'm not saying don't say it. Yes, say it. But you can't just say it and pat yourself on the back. Now I'm a monotheist, and now I've fulfilled these commandments. It's much more complicated, and it's much more difficult. So, let's see. What philosophers have I quoted tonight? I quoted Moses Mendelssohn. I quoted Moses Maimonides. I quoted Hermann Cohen. I quoted Xenophanes, my friend. And I left one great thinker out who never got the credit she deserved. My grandmother, my booby. Because my booby used to say, Schwerzer sein a Yid. It's tough to be a Jew. Thank you. <laughs>